I should watch one of the videos for this class because it's odd because I, I'm not really paying attention to what the camera can see and not see. So I have a feeling there's a lot of shots like this of the empty whiteboard <laughs> with, <laughs> with a voice beaming from it. There is. And, and every now and then, you know, I'll be talking like this and like I'll, I'll stand here. And I don't realize that that camera really only takes a very narrow thing because it goes from like about here to about actually. You're still on. I'm still on. Yeah. So that's tilted a little bit. Interesting. I'll have to see if I can tilt it a little bit the other way. But at any rate, I do apologize if that happens. Um, do notice angel service interruption. February 17th, sometime between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. I wonder when I check my mailbox later that day how many students are going to claim to have tried to upload assignments during that period of time <laughs> and say they couldn't because Angel was down or could I take them two weeks from now. <laughs> Speaking about deadlines, um, I think the design for the podcast is, was, was ostensibly due like next Tuesday, next Monday. Yeah, we can push that back a day, and we can push back the, the other one a day. Um, if I'm, um, you know, so I'm very flexible as far as the deadlines go. If you ever have any issue with the deadlines, let me know. As long as people are working on it and making progress, and I know what people are at, I don't have an issue extending deadlines. All right, what are we going to do today? Today, <coughs> we will talk about Finish up user interfaces. This is sort of one of my last thoughts on that topic. Is you know, one of our units is on typography and user interfaces. Well, I'll spend my last few words talking about user interfaces. We'll talk about audio next, and we'll talk about your next assignment. And um, we'll, we'll talk about some basic concepts relating to audio or not. Whether we will actually get around to demonstrating the audio recording software, I don't know. My guess is it will go something like this. Monday, this this is Wednesday, right? Monday, um, we will, uh, I'll spend some time in here demonstrating the audio software, and then we'll go and practice in the lab, where you can, you can practice your singing or whatever you, you want to do, all right? Um, We'll talk more about that uh, later, though. On to user interface. Um, there's a really interesting book I read a while ago. I'm at that age when I say it happened a while ago. It could have happened a couple months ago, or it could have happened like 20 years ago. Well, I maybe mean, not 20 years ago, but say five years ago. You know, like there's this great new band called The Police. You know, that that has come out, <laughs> that kind of thing. But this book is called The Economics of Attention. And this fellow makes a great point. A lot of people talk about this being the information age, all right? And the amount of data that's available is staggering compared to what it used to be. Now, the question becomes, that's a good thing, right? It's good to have all that data. It's good to have all that data as opposed to not having any data. You can't really criticize a lot of data being available, except what happens when there's too much data? Overload, right. You might not be able to find the things that you want. The data that you find may not be relevant. It may be mistaken. It may not be reliable, and so on. We're going to focus on the issue of there being too much data and that causing us to be distracted. The premise of this book is that in the information age, really what becomes important is our attention. And therefore, his title, The Economics of Attention. You know, Facebook. How does Facebook make their money? Facebook just recently had a, an IPO that went for trillions of trillions of dollars, which means he's richer than, Mark Zuckerberg is richer than, what, you know, Bill Gates and, and you know, all the, all the oil princes and all that combined, right? How do he make so much 
much money. Have you ever paid to use Facebook? No. Right, how does he make his money then? He makes it on advertising. All right. Specifically, can you describe the way that the advertisements on Facebook work? Have you ever seen an advertisement on Facebook? Okay. How, how do they work in general? You just, um, then someone go on the Facebook page, then the ad pops up on the okay. screen, someone on the screen. Right. The idea is this, putting it in terms of this framework of economics of attention, the idea is you're going to pay more attention to stuff that's relevant to your life than you will to just random stuff. Think of TV advertising. TV advertising, they can make some general assumptions, maybe, about the people watching the show, right? Um, if they were showing a football game, you know, they, they may make the assumption that the particular demographic that watches football likes to drink beer. Now, do we know if it's as true or not? I don't know. They probably have done some research and all that. But that certainly doesn't mean that every football fan drinks beer, all right? But they take their best shot, and, and they try to target their ads to who they kind of think is out there viewing them. Now, what we can say, though, is that if I post about a particular musician, I probably am interested in that musician. And therefore, an ad may very well pop up that's somehow related to what I've posted. That there's a much higher degree of assurance that um, that what you uh, that the ad that you present um, is going to be relevant to the person. And the thought is, if it's relevant to you, you're going to pay attention. If it's not relevant, you're not going to pay attention. All right. It's not always perfect. Um, sometimes, if you criticize something, you might see an ad for it. You know, in which case, yeah, something went wrong, right? And they messed up on their their, their uh, filtering uh, and, and, and advertising. But the idea is, is what essentially, they make their money in Facebook off of our attention. That's what they are selling, all right? In other words, the, 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 you know, I had a hard time understanding Facebook until I read this quote from it was a, a, a British technology columnist, I forget his name. But he said something that face, you are not Facebook's customers. You are Facebook's product. All right? Your attention is what Facebook is selling. And your attention, and the whole thing about gathering data about you. Why do you think they want to know everything you like? They want to know everything that you like so they can give you more advertisements like that. All right, and so on. Once I realized that, then things like, gee, do you like Facebook's timeline or not became irrelevant. Because if you don't like it, ask for your money back, right? The people that, uh, any, anything that they do to um, change the Facebook application is geared towards making it more efficient at collecting your interests so that they can sell your attention. All right. So that's the point. In a sea of data, attention is critical. What does this have to do with typography and user interface design? It has this to do. Typography uh, and user interface design, of which typography is a major component, are ways for us to focus our audience's attention on what we want them to see and to help them navigate their way through our site and through everything to get to what it is that they actually want. If you listen to people criticize websites, most of the time you'll hear people say things like, I can't find what I want on this site. I can't find anything on it. I go to that site and I look around and I can't find the stuff that I'm interested in. A good site, you might not even look at it and think, wow, that's a well-designed site. But you know what? Because you're not sitting there looking at the design. You're getting the information that you need. You know? Do you spend time thinking that Google is a well-designed site? No, because you spend your time Googling. All right? The design
sign of the site doesn't get in your way, and you just do the things you do. Well, bringing this back to typography and user interfaces, typography is a key element that we can go and um, make sure people uh, can get the information they need. So, how do we do that? Number one, I guess what I'm talking about is sort of the relationship between typography and user interfaces. Number one, navigation should be clear. So, if you have something on the page as navigation, that is a link to something else, it should be very clear that it's a link to something else. How do you make sure that it's known that it's a link to something else? Using typographical elements. Make it a different font. Make it a bigger font. Make it underlined. Make it a different color. Put a different background on it. Doesn't matter what you do, as long as it's clear to the person visiting the site that this is a link. Person shouldn't have to guess what they have to click on to go in and go from page to page to page. So whatever you can do typographically, set aside your navigation via white space, as opposed to having everything all crammed together, where you lose sense of it. Colors, fonts, font sizes, font decorations, these are all things that you can do to make it absolutely clear to people that these are links. That, in my mind, is one of the cheap things that you can do as far as user interface design because that's what really gets in people's ways. Now, the interesting thing is, is if you talk about websites, or if you talk about software in general, that people don't like, usually is because they're too complicated and too hard to figure out. Usually it isn't because it's too simplistic. On occasion, you'll run into a piece of software where it's like, oh, that's all it does? I guess that's, you know, not important then. I don't really need to use this. Usually the thing that people truly have problems with, though, are things that are too complicated that you can't figure out, and so on. Uh, I'm renting a car now. My, I was in a small accident like back in October, all right? So I'm just getting around to get my car fixed now. So I have a little rental car. It's a little Buick, and, and I, I, it's kind of nice. You know, I, I kind of hope they take their time fixing my car, you know, because it's nice driving this around. But the one thing I noticed, though, is the dashboard on that thing I might as well be flying the space shuttle. I can't figure out what is what. There are so many lights going off and so many things, I have no idea what to do. I have no idea how to switch from satellite radio to FM radio. There's about 50 buttons, and I keep pressing them until I get a regular radio station, but it's so unclear because it's so involved and so complicated and so cluttered. One of the problems that I've always had with cars until my most recent <coughs> car is adjusting the time when it's daylight savings time. Usually, you know, if they switch in April, usually with those old cars, it was till June till I finally got around to, to changing them. <laughs> All right? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, in, my, in, in the car that's being repaired now, there's two buttons. Set hour, set minutes. You want to set the hour? Boom, 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 boom. You want to set the minutes? Boom, 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 boom. And you're, you're good to go. I mean, they just, you know, seven o'clock shouldn't be hard. The old joke that people had uh, was, you know, so many VCRs in this country, for those of you that remember VCRs, all of them were blinking 12 o'clock because no one knew how to or bothered to or whatever uh, set the clock. So the idea here is we're going to make this simple. All right? One of the quotes in your uh, typography assignment is the title of a good book on user interface design, and it's called Don't Make Me Think. And it is uh, available in our library. And the idea is, is, you know, sometimes software developers make fun of users saying, oh, they're dumb, they don't read the screen, they don't do that. You know what, they don't. And you know what, neither do I. All right, when I'm in a hurry or when I'm looking for something, I shouldn't have to. It should be simplistic enough for me to find it. I'm going to show you <coughs> one of the worst user interface issues I've ever seen. In general, the site is okay. Nothing, un nothing exceptional, but nothing horrible either. But there's one thing on this page that absolutely drives me crazy. This is a page four, and please tell me they didn't change it. Well, I 
my gosh, maybe they changed it. I, I know the, the thing isn't on. There's no point in turning it on. Oh, here we go. I, I get annoyed when people actually go and correct the, the problems that I like to use in class to demonstrate because, you know, then, then I don't have any good examples. This is a small thing, but it's a case of making me think when I shouldn't have to think. All right? This is WRUW, which is Case Western Reserve University's college radio station. Their jazz calendar. Click more below for a complete Northeast Ohio jazz calendar. So, what do you suppose happens if you click on this? Absolutely nothing, because that is simply blue underlying text. All right? Now, if I, you know, the developer of this page says, could say something like this. What? Can't you read? Can't you say, see that it says that? Yes, I can read. I, I, I would bet that I can read at least as well as a person to design this page. All right? But I also know one of the fundamental rules for design is things that look the same ought to act the same. Here we have a whole stream of blue underlined things that are links. Link, link, boom, not a link. All right? That in my mind is like so dumb. You know, why not, you know, is, is there a link tax or something out there? You know, that, that, you know, you couldn't make that a link too? In fact, why even have that telling you to go and click on that? Why not click that while you're reading? You know, it's just really horrible. These are small things to be sure, but small things taken together add up. And one of the key things that you can do to keep a good experience is to make it clear what your navigation is. Now beyond that, Make sure that your, your, your information is organized properly, too. All right, that's the key thing. But on a typographical level, make sure that your typography gives people at a glance a sense of what the navigation is, even if they can't read the words. Uh, one designer said that they can tell if they have a good, de uh, good design if they like, take their glasses off and blur their eyes, and they can still sort of get a sense of what's going on on the page. All right, you might not be able to read the details, but you know, hey, that's the header, that's the navigation, and so on and so forth. So again, it's important that on a typographical level that we keep these things consistent. And that goes across the board too. Size typically relates to importance. So the most important headline on your page should be the biggest. All right? What is the most important piece of information on your page should take up the most space. All right? Um, lesser important things should be smaller and take up less space. If something is sort of a side note, it should look different than everything else on the page. You know, if it's just sort of like uh, additional information. All right? And how do you show all these things? How do you represent this? It's all done through typography. All right, we talked about some guidelines for that, guidelines for body text and, and header text and all that. Um, it's, it's, you know, important that we pay attention to these things when we're creating uh, a good user interface. Putting things on your page um, that are really the most important things for the users to find. You know, it, you know, you don't know how many restaurants, web pages I go to, or libraries, or other organizations where I have to hunt around to see where their hours are. You know, hey, you know, I would think that's the goal of a lot of people visiting that site. So make it obvious, send it off in a different color, put it on as soon as you access the site, and so on. So, I guess in conclusion, I did want to touch base on that. There's more resources in Angel about um, user interface design. Let's spend a second to look on the and look at these. before we get into our discussion of audio. in the 
actually, no, I'm going to be more clever than that. I'm going to press stop on the record, and I'm going to press start again so I get two files. And I'll put one of them in the typography section and one of them in the audio section. All right. User-centered design. All right. Um, actually, interface design on the web style guide. They'll have very similar sort of information than, than that that I've provided. <laughs> Navigation is not a feature of a website. It is the website, and so on. Without it, there is no there there. Interesting thing, the whole chapter is titled Information Design. The very first word in it is navigation. That shows really how critical that aspect is. So please take the time to read through this and see. Um, User-centered design is a dis uh, discussion that concerns putting the user first. Um, unfortunately, they didn't put the user first because they got rid of their file that was there at one point in time. Ten usability heuristics. Consistency. Error prevention. Recognition rather than recall. These are all very good general usability guidelines. All right, I'm going to stop the recording. This portion of the presentation will be in the typography section. The next portion will be...